Hello everyone, welcome back once again. I am Nicodemus Kane. Today is June the 12th of 2023. Something inside of the laptop has changed again. Um, I didn't even update it. Just something has changed. Uh, my microphone has reverted back to the settings it had before. I had to go through this whole rigmarole of, of getting it reset up. So if it sounds weird, that's probably why. I don't I don't know. I, things happen. It is what it is. Um, anyways, we're going to read Ezekiel 37. Um, get through this one today. This one's that's about two pages, give or take. I am a little upset about some things that are happening in the house. Um, so if I come off as a little, uh, I don't want to say perturbed. <laughs> if, I, if I come off as a little uh, short about certain things, just know that I am not really nursing some wounds. I'm just coming to some realizations, and I am trying to drive drive some bitterness away from my heart right now, because I have come to some realizations that there are people in my life that are toxic, you know? You gotta put toxic people out. Some people in my life that are toxic that you, I just have to, I have to step away from. So, we'll talk about that later. We we might. I'm not going to say we will. We might talk about that later. But I'm just telling you right now that it's just uh, some people just can't fix. You know. All right. So, Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven. I know what this one's about. This one should be interesting to read. All right, so let's do this. Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said, un he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So, this is God resurrecting dead people. Am I wrong? These are... Well, let's read it. The hand of the Lord, starting at the top, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley that was full of bones. There was a valley that was full of bones. Was it a valley where there was a war? Let's I, let's look up some words here. Let's look up some words, see if we can figure out exactly what's going on. 
Spirit of the Lord sent me down in the midst of the valley. And this is just a valley or a plain that was full of bones. Bones, limbs, substance. Carried me out in the spirit and sent me down in a valley. It does not say which valley. It just says a valley. Verse 2, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. The open, the face of the valley, the, the open valley. It's what we would consider to be, what we would consider to be, you know, the, the biggest part of the valley. That's, that's the open valley. That's the, the face of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. They're very dry. Let's let's read this. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure this out. Very dry. That's all it is. They were dry bones. Which means they had been sitting out in the sun and been bleaching for a while. So these were... They had been sitting there. They're, they weren't fleshy. They were completely picked over. It was a valley full of bones. Okay. It doesn't say where, though. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I, answer, oh, I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Only God would know. Do they live? I don't know. Do you, Father, you would know. Tell me. Please. Verse 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's from a song. Of course, you know, some people, most people probably don't know it because it's from the what is it, the 50s? It's been a while since I've heard it myself, but again, that's what they do. They use verses from the Bible so that, you know, it will lead you it will lead you to think about that more than it will lead you to think about the actual context and meaning of the Bible. Even if it's a religious song. Yes because they put it into a pop music form and it was there to lead you away. Um, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. We still don't know what valley this is. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring, and will bring, flesh, bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This is God saying, all of these dead men, dead dead men, women, children, whatever these bones were, I will bring breath back into them. As, as far as this, if you were reading this just by itself and you just heard bones, you could be thinking, well, it could be, could be humans. It could be animals for all you know. It becomes humans later, but up to this point, it could just be animals. It just could be just a bunch of animals. You say, I'm going to bring breath into these animals. Okay, whatever. But we find out that it becomes a great exceeding army, and that's where we find out it's humans. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Now, one thing I want to point out here. God did not prophesy to these bones. He caused Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones. He gave Ezekiel the power, as we all have, to pray, to prophesy, to speak to the bones. Remember, I've talked about this before. Is we have some kind of power. Our intentions, our voice, our power that we have to be able to change this world. I don't know how it works. I don't even know why it's there. I just know that it's that is it, it is a thing that is possible. God told Ezekiel to go prophesy to these bones. These bones couldn't hear him. I mean, maybe they could hear him. Who knows? But he was out there talking for no other reason than God told him to. He gave God gave him the power to be able to do that. So these bones started shaking. They started coming together. Verse 8, And then I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. 
but there was no breath in them. So these were basically zombies. These were basically lifeless, lifeless bodies that were all resurrected off of these bones in the middle of this valley. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. This is a lot. This is a lot of people. This says that this this has a connection to Revelation 11, 11. Ooh, Let's read that. Let's see what this says. At least that's what this Bible has. So connection to... Or it says that there's a connection to that one. After three days, this is... Finish your testament. Ooh, we're talking about. We're talking about two witnesses here. That's interesting. So, this one, for whatever reason, this Bible has a connection between 3710 of Ezekiel and Revelation 1111. And we are talking about the two witnesses. I'm going to go all the way up to verse 8, because when the two witnesses come out and they they have all these powers and then they are killed, the beast out of the, the pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This is the two witnesses again. It goes to verse 8, Revelation 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Ooh, go back. I don't, I don't even, I, okay. Spiritually, this place is called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Spiritually. I, I, Let's keep going, though. Man, I could I could do a whole video just on that one. Uh, Revelation 11.9. Boy, we like our 9.11s, don't we? And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see the dead bodies. These two dead witnesses that were killed by the beast that came out of the bottomless pit. And they dwell upon the earth, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. They shall rejoice and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another. What if, just what if, I'm just going to throw this out there. I've talked about this before. What if this has already happened? I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, this hasn't happened yet. The pit hasn't been opened yet. The beast from the pit hasn't risen yet. All these kings and whatever. Well, again, what if it did? And what if we have been told that it hasn't been happened? Remember, your history that you know only comes from the school that you went to. You would never know who your daddy is unless your mama told you. Remember that. Always remember that. You know nothing. You're only told what you know by somebody else. So, every time I hear, oh, they will make merry and they will send gifts to one another. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like Christmas to me. I'm, I, and I know it doesn't have to be. I know it doesn't have to be. 
And I know that I love picking on Christmas. You guys know I love picking on Christmas because they have done everything in their power to convince you that it has something to do with the birth of Christ. And it's not. And we're talking about a place. The dead body shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And it makes a point to tell you where also our Lord was crucified. Christ went back into Jerusalem and was crucified there, wasn't he? Am I wrong on that? Or was he taken to another city? I don't think he was taken to another city, was he? Spiritually, this place is called Egypt. Spiritually, this place is called Sodom. Where our Lord was crucified. Again, I could do a whole video just on that. Just talking about that. That's... I, I don't know how I... I know how I miss that because Revelation is the last part of the last part of the Bible and when you're going through it you just kind of skip over everything. But they will die there and all these people will get together and see it and then they shall make merry and sing gifts to one another. I could I could go on about that too. But verse but chapter 11 11. This is again this is coming from so I prophesied, this is Ezekiel 37, 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. So Revelation 11, 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And then after that, of course, the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And the earthquake was slain of men. Seven, seven thousand and the remnants were affrighted and gave glory to the... Okay. But that's, that's all Revelation stuff. But in the same way that these two witnesses were resurrected, this great army was resurrected. Oh, but we learned some stuff here. We learned some big-time stuff here. That's enough to make you that's enough to make you want to go open your Bible back up, do some research. And if it's not, then yeah, I don't know what to tell you. you. You need to go you need to go look that stuff up. So I prophesied the command of me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet a great an exceeding great army. This was a valley full of bones. It does not say what valley. It just says that all these all these men were resurrected. Now, let's find out who these people were. Verse 11. When he said then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I the Lord have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. So this is talking about the resurrection, but he's done this. He did this in front of Ezekiel's eyes. Where did these people go? Where did this exceeding great army go? Does it say? I'm just skimming through. I am skimming through this to see if I can see. I don't see it. He just, he resurrected all these people. Where did they go? What did they do? It doesn't say where they went. Did he let them die again? Did he let them live again? Did he decide to bring them 
to the place where they needed to be. What's happening here? Where'd all these people go? This is an exceeding great, ar great army. This is this is 10,000 plus. 20,000 plus. This is a whole lot of people that God just decided to resurrect out of some random valley in front of Ezekiel. Where did these people go? Uh, these are questions we should be asking. Where did these people go? What what, what is what is this? I mean, he resurrected them to prove a point, sure. So where did they go? Are they still just floating around somewhere? Who were these people? Well, let's go back to verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. This is the house of Israel. I don't know if it's the whole house of Israel, but he was making a point saying, I'm going to raise up the house of Israel, and I'm going to, you know, from wherever they are, I'm going to raise them all up and I'm going to bring them all back. That is exactly what Revelation says. That happens at the end of days. He will bring everybody back to life. Actually, he says he will bring every single person back to life. Those that are of, of his house, he will bring back to the city. And all the rest of them he will throw into the lake of fire. That's what the book says. So... What happened to these people? Where'd they go? Hopefully it'll tell me. Hopefully maybe it's just something that I'm missing. Hopefully it'll tell me though, because that's that's a lot of people that just were able to be resurrected before Christ. What's going on here? <laughs> Anyways, let's keep reading. I'm not trying to take away anything from the resurrection of Christ, but I am just saying that this is this is a great army. Where did these people go? What happened to this? But he says, this is metaphorical. This is These are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel, which is what it says. At the end of days, he will pull everybody back to life. He will bring back the people that he needs to, and there will be a judgment. 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Say, I shall put my spirit in you. We just read that on Friday, I think, where we were talking about they shall come, they shall want to do my laws, they shall want to do my commandments, they shall have my spirit in them. I will unstiffen their hearts. I will give them a new heart. It says this in the in other places too. I will take away all of the evil and wickedness from you, and you will want to do it. You will want to repent of the evils you have caused. It's not a, it's not a, oh, I have to, I have to go out and do this all the time. I have to go out and make the sacrifices all the time. I have to, I have to do this because I'm constantly sinning. No, you will want to follow his laws and commandments. You will want to give up the evils of this world. You will want to stop doing these things. You will want to stop whatever it is. I came to that realization that I've been living a whole my entire life is a lie. And when I read the book and I understood it and I came to those tough ones where it says, you know, do not eat swine or do not celebrate pagan holidays. 
to come away from to come away from people that you can't be around the places where it says that you can actually hold on to hate you can hold on to war you can hold on to not you can hold on to not loving everyone you don't have to love everyone you can love them for their sakes and and try to pull them out of it but there's nothing in there that says you have to you have to constantly give them something that they're they're not going to reciprocate actually your bible says you will be put away from the people that love you they will not want to listen to you they will push you away there will be enmity between father and daughter mother and son there will be clashes because you choose to believe and it says that you bring it with one or two witnesses and if they choose not to listen then you walk away it is one of those things that so many people want to say you have to love them no matter what where does it say that you got to love them i i don't i don't wish i don't wish a lake of fire upon anybody i don't i really truly absolutely 100% wish that so many people would just stop and really look at the things that they're doing and take a look at how truthful the bible has been in predicting these things would happen and they would stop and at least take a moment to say well hey wait a minute maybe there is something there maybe you know and if they choose to go their own way after that fine i don't have to live with their lives i'll tell you this much right now i don't have to i don't have to live in a place where there's evil there's nothing in the bible that tells me that i have to live in a place where there's absolute evil especially if it dwells in my house so when you read it and you read these things and we went through the psalms we went through other different places where it said to put these people out there is nothing in the bible that says you have to put up with it but some people think you have to some people think that you have to put up with that and if you can hey that's that's i feel for you though because you are not experiencing any joy whatsoever in this world you are constantly putting up with something and if that is your way if that is what god has for you then that is what god has for you for me and mine though i have i have had to let so many people go in my life because i can't i can't hold on to that i have to move forward i cannot move backwards i cannot be stifled by people that want to live in this world when all i'm trying to do is move forward i've given i've given them the warnings i've told them what they can and can't do i've said if you want it it's still there so always make sure you tell people that if you're going to turn away from somebody if you're going to have to say i can't be around you anymore you know this is it's too much always make sure to tell them but i'm always here if you're ready if you're ready for it but i can't do this i can't go out with you anymore to the places that we used to go out to and do the things we used to you know i can't talk to you about the things we used to talk to about cuz i want to be different perfect example I, we went out to and nobody brought it up which was good thankfully cuz i was so worried about it my dad invited me out to pizza on sunday uh my dad came into came into town and uh he does it all the time it was him and his brother and one of their friends and you know the wives and, but he invited me to come in so i said sure but i was i was a little worried about it you know cuz I've stopped eating pork. So whenever I order a pizza without pepperoni, what are they going to say? But nobody said anything, thankfully. That was that was good. But 
it's it's one of those things, you know, where it's like if this causes a rift, we're gonna have to see it through to the end, and I'm gonna have to tell them the truth. What's what's gonna happen then? So you know, it's one of those deals. That's perfect example. Is that you want to change? You want to do it? You want to? You want to be something different? I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. Perfect tagline. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. But where did these people go? This was a great exceeding army that he lifted up, that he resurrected. Where did they go? Verse 15. Let's keep going, though. Verse 15. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah. And for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. This is the grafting. I talk about this a lot. Actually, if you want to have a good understanding and explanation the best way that somebody that's way more learned and understanding of this can tell you is to go watch the Rob Skibra Ephraim Awakening to really get the understanding so this is Ephraim a son of Joseph also the tribe descended from him Ephraim means double ash heap. I shall, dub, I shall be doubly fruitful. Uh, mountain of Ephraim is called a northern. Use the name for the northern kingdom. A city near, near Baal Hazor. Hazor. Let me go ahead and search this up. So Ephraim I'm kind of looking. Hold on a second. The best way that I've been able to describe this it was one of the sons of Joseph. Hold on a second. Come here. Where are we at? It was a son of Joseph. These were the people. This was the tribe that eventually turned into Gentiles. The way I understand it. Now, I could be wrong on this, but the way I understand it, and that these were the ones that were spread far and wide, that fell away, because these were the ones that were, they were brought up in Egypt. They were the ones that were brought up in Egypt, and they were, you know, spread out as much as possible. What the Jewish of today would call Gentiles those that were always a part of the family but were called something else so what this is saying and we'll read it let's go ahead and read it though verse 15 the word of the lord came again unto me saying moreover thou son of man take thee one stick and write upon it for judah and for the children of israel his companions so this is this is judah and the children of israel this is the people that I have been trying to talk about for this whole time, saying these are my people that I will bring back in and I will do all this and I will do all that and whatever it is. Okay. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, 
the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. These were the people that forgot. These were the ones that were still part of the family, but had mixed through all of the heathens, if you will, all of the Gentiles, if you will, all of the leftovers. And somebody could argue this with me. Uh, again, I'm, I don't have a perfect understanding of it. I should probably go back and watch the Ephraim Awakening myself. But this is basically saying, take one stick for Judah, for the house of Israel, take another stick for Ephraim, for those that have been lost, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. For those that were mine, and for those that have become lost, the ones that are being awakened, for those that want to be a part of it, that want to be adopted into it, the ones that are grafted into it, we're all God's children. We all descended from somewhere. He's done his best to keep us all where we are so that we could all have a part of it. And he says, this is the way it will work. Is I will take my people and I will take my leftover remnants from elsewhere and I will pull them back together. And it has always been an option for anyone. I've said it from the very beginning. If they want to come in, if they want to follow our ways, they can do that. But it has always been an option there. And there are so many people now that are waking up to this, are coming to this understanding, this, this revelation that there is something different going on here. I mean, maybe... I, I don't want to say... No, 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 I'm not going to go that way. It, it's... Over the past six, seven, eight, seven, eight years, there has been this opening of the eyes. I've talked about it before is the apocalypse that the Mayan calendar predicted in 2012. An apocalypse is an awakening, it's an understanding, it's an opening of the eyes. Um, so many people have had their eyes open. A lot of people have gone the way of a conspiracy theory route. And a lot of those people have eventually come to God in some way, shape, or form. I've seen it. I was there for a lot of people to watch. You know, they would, they would start talking about just the, the low-level conspiracy stuff. And as they just kept getting into it more and more and more, it basically became, it was my journey is what it was, is, is that I see so much evil and corruption now that I can't help but notice that the Bible says exactly this word for word. And it's like everybody had the same exact opening of understanding all at once. And God says that's given to us because he wants to bring those people back. He wants to meld those bloodlines back together. He wants to bring us back in. It doesn't matter what your descendants are or what your, not descendants, it doesn't matter what your, um, your ancestors are. It doesn't matter. He's always wanted people to understand you can come back to it.
no matter who you are. I've already said I don't know who I am. It doesn't matter. Because if you want to be a part of it, you can. All you have to do is repent of the ways of this world. Have faith that Christ came for you, died for you, washed you clean, and accept it. Accept the salvation. Accept the accept it with a whole heart he will change your heart it has said that before it said that he will take the stone out of your heart or whatever it was he will you know take your your heart of stone away and he will give you a fleshly heart full of spirit and you will want to change your ways and he does that because he says i will bring these sticks together i will graft these these sticks together you will be become a part of the tree of israel and it says it in other places too i will bring my people back and the gentiles shall dwell in the midst of them and they will all be my people which means they will all be grafted in they will all be adopted into the family they will all be a part of it I go on and on about it because, again, so many people will go on and on about, you know, who is and isn't going to be saved or who is and isn't going to have have that and share in that. And anyone. And that's that's one of the tricks. One of the tricks of the devil is very. Is it's for him to say, well, you know. Only so many of us can get in. Only, you know, only these people are going to be able to get in. Everybody else isn't going to be able to get in. You're just going to have to, you know. That's just another trick. That just, that that takes away your hope. That takes away your hope and takes away your ability to say, well, I can have that too. So what would you do if you have no hope? Well, you just give up on life. You go after other gods. That's probably been the trick of this whole thing from the very beginning. So you go, out, go after other gods because you think you can't get in. When in reality, you absolutely can. You just have to put... <coughs> Excuse me. Let me take a drink here. Hold on. You just have to put away your put away the wickedness of the past and come to him just be better that's just that's what it is uh, I am again I am sure so many other people can argue that I'm just seeing it from my perspective I'm sure there's probably other perspectives um I'm sure there's a lot of people that, you know, again, they can tell me I'm absolutely wrong. And I probably am. I've said it before. I'm not, I'm not your teacher. I am not, I am not, uh, anyone that has any kind of education on any of this whatsoever. I'm just trying to figure it all out. Just like everybody else. All I'm going on is what I'm reading and what I've heard other people say but when you hear it enough and you understand it enough and you you kind of get into it you got to kind of draw some conclusions for yourself so let's keep going though 17 and join them one to another in one stick and they shall become one in thine hand all right i already read that one okay 18 and when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall become one in mine hand. That's exactly what I was pretty much alluding to. Before. Let's go back to 18. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, 
Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Your Bible is basically saying, so if you don't understand what's going on, here's what it means. 19, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, which is, you know, again, Ephraim was Joseph's kid, Joseph's son, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, the people that were with them, and will, t- and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. I will bring them back, because Ephraim was the offspring of Joseph with an Egyptian wife, and he was brought up in the Egyptian ways, and one of the things that happened was the house of Israel was turned into slaves in Egypt. That means that within whatever it was, two generations of Joseph leaving, or not leaving Egypt, but you know, passing away in Egypt, because you got to remember that they were, you know, they were brought in, and and the Pharaoh made him second in command, whatever it was, and um, somewhere along the line, the children of Joseph were turned into Egyptians that they went a separate way. So much so to the point that again, it was the Egyptians enslaving the people of Israel. So they were turned into something else. The children of Ephraim and the children of Ephraim, they were still God's people, but they They were falling away to the point that he said, I have to pull them back. I have to pull them back. And it's not going to matter who they are. There's. That makes sense to me. It's understanding, right? Let's keep going, though. So verse 20. How long does this go? Try to look for the next pilcro. Okay, this goes all the way to the end. Verse 20, And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation, and land upon the mountain of, mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations." Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell there, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. It doesn't change anything I said. Let's see if I can get back to the page. Doesn't change anything I said. Back to 20. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. That does not mean that he's not bringing the Gentiles along too. It's just the from among the heathen. There's always that separation. It always talks the difference between the Gentiles, the ones that are not supposedly the chosen people 
that get to come along anyway in the heathen. There's always a, a differentiation between the two because the heathen are going to do heathen things. The Gentiles may or may not want to have it. They're just the ones that are just out there just, you know, trying to exist. Where was I at? I just lost it. From among the heathen. There it is. Whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. 22. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. Well, one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. We're talking about Judah and Israel. It's, it's, they got separated for whatever reason. Ephraim itself, too, got separated for what is it? But he's going to bring everybody back together. You can definitely tell that I was out with my father yesterday because my throat is hurting because I was talking a lot yesterday. You can definitely tell. But it's it's hurting right now. Um, where are we at? 23. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, because they fell. Not only did Judah fall because they were swayed by the evils of the people that they were allowing to come in, but the stick of Ephraim, these people were brought up in Egyptian ways. So they were already falling. They were separated way before all this other stuff started happening. So they will give all this stuff up, their idols, their detestable things, and their transgressions. They will give it up. They will come out of it. They will stop doing it. Again, it's about coming to God, having faith, and repenting of what you've done. Of what you're doing. Coming away from it. Wanting to not do these things. Wanting to step away from it. Not just going to church and then doing it. Monday through Friday, uh, stop being a Monday through Saturday sinner. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. And, sh and so shall they be my people and I will be their God. How will, we how will he cleanse them? He will sprinkle water upon them. Remember we talked about this. He will sprinkle water upon them and then they, he will give them a new heart and they want to do stuff. It says it right here too. 24 and David my servant shall be king over them and they shall and they all shall have one shepherd we all know who this shepherd is we all know who David his servant who is going to be king we all know who that will be they shall also walk in my statutes or walk in my judgments they shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them they shall not be pulled into Christianity and, and decide what isn't isn't worthy for them to, to be a statute or a judgment for them to walk in. They will want to walk in his judgments, in his statutes, which is his commandments. Twenty-five, And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servants, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. We all know who the servant David is. Twenty-six, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Guess who else will be there? All those Gentiles that want to come along with it. It said it before. It said it in, what did it say in Jeremiah and Isaiah? Which one? Which one was it? Where it said, and the Gentiles shall come 
and they shall be there with it. I have it, I should have it written down somewhere where it was talking about. <clears throat> Je Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16 is where the 16, 19, Gentiles, surely we've inherited lies, they shall come to me, and then they shall wind up later on being in the midst of the Israelites, of the house of Israel, they shall make their gardens there, they shall build their houses there. They shall be there. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're not worthy. He wants us all to come back. Because I've heard that before. I've, heard, I've actually heard people say, well, you know, only certain people are going to be able to get in. There's, there's a group of people right now that say they're God's chosen people. What am I going to do if they're, if they, they're going to be able to get saved and I can't get saved? Well, there's nothing that says that. He chose his people because he chose his people. There's, I, I don't know why. That's just what he did. But it was always there. You don't, you're... <sighs> the reason that God wiped out certain peoples in the Bible was because he said, you will be cursed. I have not read anything that says that all the Gentiles will be cursed forevermore. What I read is that if they choose to follow our ways, if they choose to come to us, if they choose to believe, if they choose to do this, if they choose to do that, they can come in. And it's definitely not if they choose to come into the building and pray, yet go back to their evil, wicked ways. There's nothing about that. That's how evil creeps into the church. That's exactly what it is. Oh, we will allow all people. You will allow all people, but they will not change their ways. And when they don't change their ways, you find out that your church starts changing to fit their ways. That is exactly how corruption got into the church in the first place. That is how darkness crept into the church into, in the first place. Was that in order to placate the people, they changed the ways of the church. Best example, best modern example I can give you is you want to, you want to allow a homosexual into the church, which is absolutely fine, but you need to, you need to tell him how to repent of his ways or her. You need to show them this is not what God wants. It's not what he wants. You can do whatever you want to. You can do whatever you want to in this world. It doesn't matter. God will give you the ability. If you want to go out and if you want to sin every single day of your life, you have fun. He will give you a heart of, he will give you that heart of deception where you don't have to worry about anything and you can go off and you can do everything you want. He doesn't want that. God takes no pleasure in punishing the wicked. We've read that four times now at least. He does not take pleasure in punishing the wicked. But he allows the wicked to have their pleasure because that's what they want. But he always says, someday I will judge you. You can have all the fun you ever want, but one of these days I'm going to bring the hammer down. I will resurrect you. This life will be yours, but your next life will be mine. People don't talk about that that much. Everyone gets that second life. And when that happens, God says, that's when I will judge you. You will live. You will die. I will resurrect you. Then I will judge you. So what you do in this life is up to you. 
but you will bring them into your church and you will hope that they will change but when they don't change and you have to keep that spirit of love and you keep letting them come in and more and more they are able to convince you that oh well I can bring more people in if you just let me if you just you know soften your voice just a little bit soften your ways just a little bit I can bring more people in so what do they do they soften their voice they soften their people there they soften their preaching just a little bit more hold on a second <clears throat> I'm still here, guys. Hold on. I'm still here. That was my granddaughter. You know how this is. You know how this works. She wanted to... <laughs> First thing she came in and said, Papa, I need you to buy me a new balloon. My balloon popped. She had a balloon from yesterday. She, um... Her dad um, is having twins with his girlfriend. Um, yes, I know. I, uh, these kids just... I could talk about it later, but I can tell you this much. that they, They're having twins, and they did a... Uh, they're finding out they're having boys, and she had a balloon, and she was like, Peppa, I need you to buy me a new balloon. Mine popped. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll get you a new balloon, but I'm busy, baby. She said, hold on, I got something else I got to tell you. <laughs> I'm like, like, all right, baby, make it quick. I got one more thing, hold on. And I was like, she was like halfway through it. She was like, no, 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 let me finish. <laughs> She's getting to be too big, man. She's getting to be... She's getting to be way too big. I can't remember where, where were we at? What were we saying? Uh, I can't even remember now. <laughs> 26. Let's go back to 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will sink, set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. The Gentiles will be there. 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Again, the heathen. Let's go ahead and look up that word. If this turns out to be everybody else, I'm going to... from the same root as Gentile. Don't do that to me. Usually of a non-Hebrew people. But then again, okay, so here, you ready for this? It is a nation of people. Usually of a foreign nation, hence a Gentile. Okay, but, 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 wait, 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 wait. It is a nation of people usually of a non-Hebrew people, 
but there's also two of them right in the middle there. Two definitions of descendants of Abraham or of Israel. This is a strong concordance telling you that this word could mean of the Gentiles. The heathen of the Gentiles. But it could also be the descendants of Abraham. Which remember, it said that his people were going to be blessed. He was going to be blessed with many, many children, as many as the sands of the earth. Or also of Israel. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. All those that are not Israel. Shall know that I shall sanctify Israel. So is the context of that the Gentiles, anybody that's left? Is there a negative connotation here? Well, you know, <clears throat> it also says... Uh, it also says a sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Well, if the Gentiles are to be, if the Gentiles are all to be thrown into this pit of fire, how would they know that his people are going to be sanctified in the midst of them forevermore? Because the Gentiles themselves are supposed to be killed off, right? That's what people tell us. Well, you're not Israel, so you don't get to live. You're going to be thrown in a lake of fire. All of those that are not written in the book of life get to be thrown into the lake of fire. But the Gentiles shall be there dwelling in the midst of the Israelites. <clears throat> I keep saying it. I keep saying it. Anyways, apparently the house is starting to wake up. The house is starting to wake up. The new rule of the house is that whenever... The granddaughter wakes up. She immediately has to go wake up mommy because mommy has to take care of it. That's the new rule because it used to be that whenever whenever our granddaughter woke up that it was either me or my wife would take care of it. Now it has become, no, mommy needs to take care of her stuff because it's wearing on us. Um... And I'm not trying to blast on my stepdaughter at all or do anything like that. I'm just saying that we have new rules now. <laughs> because because it it was getting to the point to where, you know, it's like I said, you get to you get to sleep in while we have to take care of your kids. Well no, now it's time for you to take care of your kids. It's it's time. It's time for us to start kicking the bird out of the house. The baby birds out of the house. Let's put it that way. Because it is causing a little bit of friction. I'm not going to lie. It's a little bit of friction in the house. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I don't even remember what I was talking about at the very beginning either. Um, about having to put people away. That's one of the things I was I was saying in the middle too is is sometimes you just cannot reconcile your I don't want to really say beliefs but your your life with other people sometimes you have to step away. Sometimes you have to step away and you have to tell the other persons like, hey, man, I, well, this don't work. This doesn't work at all. We have to <clears throat> we have to move on. We have to move on. We can't do this. And I'm not as spiteful as I was when I started this. I can tell you that much. It's amazing how how God's word has this calming effect on me, which I appreciate, but, um, yeah, I've, I've had a, a moment, especially this morning, where I feel like 
I may have wasted my time. <laughs> I may have wasted my time with some people. And now I'm coming to the realization that, hey, you know, some people don't want to change. Some people don't want to change so much so to the point that once you start seeing it, once you start seeing that their patterns of... Once you start seeing the patterns of wickedness and evil consistently run through. This is very similar to what I was talking about before. Is, you know, having to step away from certain people. Once you see those patterns and you start understanding that that's not going to change. Well, you have to walk away. You have to say, fine. You got to live your own life. I can't do it for you. I feel more content now that I've said it. I feel better now that I've said it. I really do. Because it was... I'm not going to lie. It was weighing a little heavy on my head there for a second. I was like, what the... the what? I don't get... I don't get people sometimes, man. I really don't. There is a darkness and an evil that has caused people to not keep love in any part of their heart. They don't want love. They don't want respect. They don't want friendship. A kindred friendship with people they want to be separated because that's all they know because all this world has taught them and for a lot of people that that consumes them that's how they live their life that's how they live their way and you do feel a sorrow in your heart for them because all they want is that darkness. All they want is that. All they want is that life where all they had is, you know, this is my, this is the way that, that I have done this. This is the way I'm going to keep doing this. And this is... I will destroy every relationship that I have. Because I choose this. And it's sad. It's really sad. And for anyone else that's going through that, that has gone through that, that has seen it and understands it, I'm right there with you. I get it. I get it. The worst part about it is if you know the Father, if you know God, if you know His ways, if you know how this turns out in the end, the worst part of all this is that for a lot of people, it will be too late for them. And they will never see it. And they will never get to move on to the next place. And that hurts more than anything else. I've already said, I might not be going either. Father and I are still working. We're working. We're, we're pulling me back on the path. I think this is a part of it. I think the father told me, hey, you're, you're hanging out with some bad people you should probably start pulling away from that. I think that's what's happening, is that you were doing really good, and then you started hanging out with some bad people, and now it's... I think that's what's going on. I think he's clearing my head. I think, you know, we're clearing house. That's what we're doing. But for everything else, yeah, I mean, it's just... <sighs> some people, you cannot... You can't win. 
and it's not for them to have. And it hurts. It does hurt. You really, truly wish that you could save people. But some people don't want it. Some people don't want it. They just want to live in this world. And the only thing I can tell you on that is if God wants to let them live in this world, if God wants to give them that deception that they want to exist in, then what do you have to do? You have to live the, let them live in that deception. Plant the seeds, but then walk away. That's all you can do. All right. I'm going to get going. Um, thanks for coming around. Thanks for listening. I hope you guys have a good week. It's a Monday. <laughs> it is definitely a Monday. I shall talk to you all later. God bless everyone. You take care of yourselves.